Oh, uh, wait, you're listening. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. <coughs> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know the program. Okay, well, let me just yeah, let, let me just, just do the thing. Yeah, do let, the let thing just... and then because uh, I'm still like I don't quite get it. So, okay, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Latif, Lulu, Radio Lab, um, Lulu, you have been out there making your <laughs> chart topping new series, Terrestrials. <laughs> I've been um, down in the musical nature children's trenches. Yeah, that's right. And you were out in the world. Yeah. So I've been doing some other stuff. I've been sort of keeping myself busy. Uh-huh. So one, I wanted to tell you about one of the projects that I that I did, which is a few, a few weeks ago. Um, our uh, executive producer, Susie Lechtenberg, and I went yeah. to Denver, Colorado. Uh-huh. Um, and I moderated a conversation with the one and only literal rock star... <laughs> David Byrne. What was getting the call to do that like? Oh man, it was it was well first let me say if you happen to not know who David Byrne is, he was the front man of and co-founder of the uh, band Talking Heads. Uh you know, you've probably seen him like on HBO or on Broadway or yeah, his his music is in your head even for if sure. you don't realize it. For sure. Yes. Hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for being here. So so the reason that they asked me to do an event with him was mm-hmm. that he created this immersive theatrical, it's like a happening. I don't know. It's an event. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. We are here tonight to celebrate the world premiere production of Theater of the Mind and experience many years in the making. It was an article about it, and it basically just said, it, it's it like, the, the headline was, take a trip through David Byrne's head, which is basically what it is. <laughs> it's like a giant warehouse where you walk through. And like hear things and see things. And hear things and see things. And then it's it's also very kind of, it involves a lot of neuroscience um, mm, about. I'm sensing why they called Mr. Latif Nasser. And now it is my That's great right. pleasure yeah, exactly. to exactly. our moderator for this evening. Please welcome to the stage Latif Nasser. So basically it was this, it was a live conversation. There were 900 people in this giant ballroom and I was on stage with David Byrne and the neuroscientist Talia Wheatley from Dartmouth College. Wow. Uh, wow. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. My so what I want to do today is play for you and for everyone uh, some of that conversation. Okay. You don't need to have seen the show for it to make sense. The vast majority of the people in the audience had not seen the show. Mm-hmm. Instead, what we've got planned for tonight but uh, is something a bit different. There's sort of two uh, reasons I'm playing it. One is because it feels like a throwback to very early old school radio lab uh, when mm-hmm. every episode was about neuroscience. Um <laughs> But also, like, I found this conversation, like, I found it sort of unsettling. Hmm. It kind of makes this argument, I think, both David and Talia do, where it's like, you're not perceiving what you think you're perceiving. You're not seeing what you think you're seeing. You're not hearing what you think you're hearing. You don't know what you think you know. But but also, that's none of that is necessarily a bad thing. Well, that's how I'm taking it right well, but, now. But, but there's another way to take all of this that, okay. that I think Talia and David both will kind of gift, gift to you uh, okay. in, this, in the course of this conversation. Okay. So here we go. Uh, so to start, Talia, I'll actually, I'll rope you in in a moment. But first, I just wanted to get off the top the origin story of this show, Theater of the Mind, which is the reason why we are all here. David, uh, just tell us what, what is Theater of the Mind uh, and how did it start? Well, uh, in <clears throat> 2011, I think it was, I read a story in a, in a magazine called New Scientist, about a experiment that a lab in Stockholm did, uh, the, and their paper was called "Being Barbie," and Barbie, Barbie, like the doll. Huh. They were exaggerating a little bit, but basically, it was the experiment. You, uh, the subject, were is embodied in the body of a doll. You felt like you were doll size. What they found interesting was that being that size changed your relationship to everything. You, how far away you thought things were, how big you thought things were, that those things weren't constant, but they were based on your body image. 
And then if you thought you were small, then things looked big. And, but I read this, and they didn't use a Barbie doll. Barbie dolls are anatomically... <laughs> not human beings? Yeah, not really human <laughs> beings. You can't really be embodied in a Barbie doll. Um, so... I read, Unfortunately, for those of you who are hoping such yeah, a thing. Yeah, if you were hoping. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, read, I read this, and I, my first thought was, I want to do this. I want to experience this. Um, so I wrote to them, kind of cold, and wrote to them and said, I would love to present your experiment in an art gallery in New York. Sort of one person at a time, visitors to the art gallery could experience what, you've, what you're doing. Much, much later, I got a response that was uh, a little bit fantastical and very imaginative, but it was not really a yes. <laughs> I'm, I put it aside, but didn't forget it. And I, just as an amateur enthusiast, I read more books and things about neuroscience and psychology and things, and began to kind of collect other things. So, oh that thing sounds like it would be fun to do, or that sounds like it would be really amazing to experience, and would that change the way I, I see things? I started get, collecting a thing. I ran into uh, the woman, Mala Gankar, who came, became my writing partner on this, and we both saw science as being a very creative endeavor, very much akin to the arts. So we thought, what if we could present more of these things and not just one, and make a whole little project out of it. So we dreamed and collected things and kept at it and started doing workshops. And eventually we did sort of a smaller version in Menlo Park, California, that's Silicon Valley. And um, it included some of the experiences that are in the present show, but it also included some other ones that were more kind of social and psychological and things like that. And we discovered that some of those things didn't... They worked as science. The results were valid in the way people responded, but they didn't work as an audience experience. Because hmm. um, they were boring? Like, what... what? Well... <laughs> you, want me to go, uh, you want me to go into one of these, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, tell you, you know, you're familiar with this one, I think. <laughs> One of them was based on the work of a guy named Alex Todorov, who does a lot of work on faces, face recognition, how you determine you know, what people are expressing with their faces. And so he did one where you would be shown very quickly two images of politicians. They were real politicians, but they, you didn't know them. They weren't well-known politicians. They were from different regional areas. Uh, you weren't told what party they were from. You weren't told their names, anything else. You just saw these headshots, and you were asked, tell us which one you think is going to win. And, just, and then we'd go to the next one, and the next, and the next. You'd tally up the average of all the people, and it could be as high as 70% matched the election results. Oof. Yeah, woof. <laughs> woof. That was the audience reaction, too. It was like... <laughs> I didn't decide that. <laughs> or, and it was just like bad news. It was bad news. <laughs> uh, it sort of undermines your faith in democracy a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah all that undermines your faith in democracy. It makes you feel like, oh, God, is, that, is that what we are? Is that the way we are? Really? Oh. That's what you're telling us here? Uh, I realized, no, there's, a, there's another way to do this. So we had to... It's, it's valid science. and It's interesting work, but as a show, it did not, <laughs> no, it didn't work. So we learned that, and we also learned that what we were doing and the way we were presenting it was much more, it needed to be more theatrical than just a series of experiences. That led us basically to where we were. Uh, it turns out a friend of Charlie's, who was just standing here. Charlie Miller, uh, who's a producer for Theater of the Mind. Uh, saw that. Mm -hmm. version and mentioned it to Charlie and eventually Charlie tracked me down 2018 maybe and Charlie s said I'm interested in your show I want you to come and look at a possible 
space. It was a, a grow space um, that, had, <laughs> that had been busted. <laughs> Amazing. They had been busted for looping, which means they're selling small quantities to the same people over and over and over again, which you're not allowed to do. Wow. And it was kind of a, mm, kind of sort of a crime scene. Uh, God bless you, Denver. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. We, we walked into the space, which kind of it was big enough, and the, the police had sawed the top off the, the safe. Oh, wow. As <laughs> many of you probably know, uh, this business, th that business is all cash business. <laughs> so... <laughs> we get here? What are we talking about? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Yeah. Long story short. Yeah. I came back again. We looked at other places. That yeah. one didn't work out. And eventually. Okay. Script rewrites. We had a director, Andrew Scoville, who did an incredible job, an incredible creative team. So, right. So kind of just for those of you who just to give you the bare bones of what the show is. So it's exactly as David said, it's a theatrical experience, a series of rooms you go through where each room there's sort of based on different neuroscientific research and so i saw the show last night when i went through the show there was one of the experiments that sort of caught my ear and i wanted to play it for everybody tonight um it involves a gorgeous piece of uh, orchestral music um shall we do it okay uh can we play the uh the tritone <laughs> okay so that was it <laughs> Um, okay, and we will play it again, uh, but before we do, I want you to listen to the notes carefully uh, and pay attention to whether the notes are going up, whether they're ascending, or going down, whether they're descending. Um, if you hear them going up, I want you to raise your hand. If they're going down, put your hand on your heart. Okay, and uh, Talia and David, you do it too. Yeah. Um, Can we ask people to close their eyes? Yeah, that's right. Right. So you're not influenced by what your neighbors so think. Everybody close your eyes, close your eyes, close my eyes. Uh, okay, let's play the tritone again. Okay, so again, up if it's up, uh, on, your, on your heart if it's going down. Okay, now everybody open your eyes. Whoa! Wow, oh, nice. I think it's probably... It's kind of extraordinary. 50-ish, yeah. maybe a little more uh, on heart, maybe? Um, okay, now let's do it. I'm gonna play it one more time. Now, like, actively try to hear the other thing. Um, and if you can, raise your hand. Ah. Um, okay, okay, let's play the tritone again. You can flip from one to the yeah, other. Yeah, I can flip. Wow, I could not flip. Okay, um, okay, so Talia, uh, <laughs> I know this is not exactly your area of expertise, but what just happened? Um, <laughs> and is it just that all the people who didn't hear what I heard need to go to an audiologist or something? <laughs> I didn't hear what you heard. Okay. Um, yeah, so what you just heard was a pair of shepherd tones, uh, half octave apart, and the shepherd tone is really interesting because it's the same note played in all the octaves at the same time. So imagine you're at a keyboard and you're hitting all of the Cs, right? And then that's a shepherd tone C, and then you're hitting all of the F sharps. That's a shepherd tone F sharp. Now, and you might know this, if you're sitting in front of a keyboard, the middle octave kind of sounds to our ears as that it's the louder of the octaves. Like as you go further away from the middle to the ends of the keyboard, it gets quieter. And that's really helpful because that orients us to where we are in pitch space, so we can tell whether things are going up or down. But remember that shepherd tones are all of the Cs <laughs> at the same time, so there is no help from where you are on the keyboard. And if you think about it, any given C is you know, up from one F sharp and down from another, another and all the F, one F sharp is up from another C and down from the C. So it's a perfectly ambiguous stimulus. There is no right answer. Right? So our brains don't really like ambiguity. We want answers to things. So hmm. all of us, all of our brains are trying to resolve what was going on, right? And there's no right answer, but people have a tendency to go one way or the other. And you can use conscious control. Some of us can use conscious control to flip it, but it's hard. But we all have a natural tendency to go one way or the other. 
David, I'm curious, as a musician, well, first of all, the fact that you've heard this now so many times, but also as a musician, are you hearing this different from the rest of us? No, not at all. I think I'm as susceptible as anyone else. For me, um, what is in incredibly interesting about this is that what we just saw, that the audience gets more or less split, and you realize, what other things are we not right. experiencing the same? Yeah. What are, are we seeing things different? Are we tasting things different? Or yeah. what else that we don't even know about? Right. Talia, is there, like, how, how, how do you become one person who goes one way or the yeah. other? I mean, this is where, for me, it gets really psychologically interesting and deep uh, because it's not random. Um, it's based on your experiences. So it's based on the sounds you hear in your daily life. So there are actually, your know, parts of the country tend to go one way, um, that another part of the country goes another way. And it's the accents that you're hearing, it's the languages that you're hearing, it's the music that you're steeping in. Your experiences are tuning your brain, right? Your brain wants to adapt to the environment it's in, and so it wants to fit, and so it's constantly continuously in flux, right? We are uh, the sounds we hear, we're the music we listen to, just as we are the books we read and the films we watch and the conversations we engage in. Our minds are constantly changing and adapting. We're continuously in flux. Hmm. Well, okay, so the, uh, there is actually another experiment that oh, you right. do with yeah. your students at Dartmouth. You want to sure. do it right here, this right now? Sure, this is fun too. Um, Okay, so I'm going to show you. Okay, so, so, so at this point uh, during the show, we, we did this thing with the audience where we flashed them two images. Okay. A pair of images, okay? And they are very similar. It looked like they were identical pictures of a big red barn in a lush green wood, mm. wooded area, right? And okay. they, they looked Lovely. identical. Okay. But they're not perfectly the same. And then Talia told us that there was one non-trivial difference between these two images. And I want you to try to spot the change from one image to the other. And I want you to raise your hand as soon as you spot it. Okay. All right. Yeah, we don't it shout out what it is. Don't shout what it is. Yeah. Just raise your hand when you see it. So, and we went back and forth. So it'd be like image A, image B, image A, image B, image A, image B. And you're just okay. literally going flashing back and forth, back and forth. And, Ooh, and as okay. you're looking at it, your eyes are kind of like racing around trying to like. To be like, where's the gorilla? Where's, yeah, the, exactly. where's the orange flower? Yeah, okay. Totally. And it was like, okay, raise your hand if you see it. Okay, three hands are up. Four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. I'm going to say 20. And like people would like raise their hands slowly at, like huh. in this 900 person audience. 30. Come on, keep trying. Wow. People would slowly raise their hand <laughs> as they saw it. All right. What are we up to? About 25%? 30%? If you have not seen it yet and you are very frustrated, know that it took me <laughs> way longer. It took me literally the entire dress rehearsal um, to figure this okay, out. Okay. We're about half the room now. All right. Shall we give them a hint? Uh, yeah, give them a hint. All right. Look at the tree branch. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, that's so delicious, that. Oh, okay. Okay. Off of the tree branch was another branch that had, like, leaves and bright red berries. And, like, it was like a, it was like a huge thing. So what? How could you miss? It's not like it's subtle, right? How could you miss that? And the reason uh, that it's surprising to us that we miss it is because we walk around and our brains deliver us this beautiful image of seeing all of this room all at once, all color out to the edges, all perfectly detailed. That's not actually how we see. First of all, there isn't color in the world. That's our brains painting color onto the world based on wavelengths of light. And we don't see detail all around us. That's our brain constructing it based on a lot of assumptions. How we actually see is our attention um, picks out some details, 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 with our eye movements four times a second or so. And from that, little bits of information, we paint out the entire thing. 
That's an amazing hallucination. It's an amazing <laughs> construction of reality that our brains do this and do this <laughs> so well that you have to create these kinds of visual illusions just to see like the man behind the curtain, right? Just to see who's creating this Wizard of Oz. Because we don't see all this. We just see that. And, for, and why some people got it faster than others. Uh, if you got it right away, it's because you just got lucky. You just <laughs> happen to look at just the spot that changed. And others of you are like, uh, uh, and then you're trying to do it like methodically, you know. <laughs> that's why it took so long, because that's how vision works. But aren't we lucky that we have brains that create these beautiful images for us? David, how long did it take you? It took me forever. It took me a really long time. Funny. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, the conversation will go from our individual ways of perceiving the world to what that means when we interact with each other. That's in just a minute. We're back, picking up again where we left off in the live convo I had with David Byrne and Talia Wheatley on stage live at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. Talia, your research sort of takes this even a step further. Uh, so we're, if we're all perceiving the world differently and then we're interacting with one another, um, how does that play out? What happens next? <laughs> um, you have a few examples of this from your own research, from your colleagues' research. Right. Well, it's not the case that we see, we all see the world differently. I think things just couldn't get off the ground if we were all completely different. We kind of cluster together. Some of us see the world more similarly than, than others. And that's important. We've known for a long time, by the way, that people cluster together. I mean, uh, your friends probably are around the same age as you, probably the same gender as you. Right? People kind of cluster. Girls want to be with the girls. It's an old Talking Heads reference, if you get that. Uh, but demographics only go so far, right? I'm not, I'm not friends with all the girls. I'm only, you know, our inner circle is like four to six people big. So how do we choose who those people are? And it turns out that friends' brains are remarkably similar. They process the world in remarkably similar ways. We took, pe we, we took people who were friends, and we took people who were friends of friends. So this, these are people that are not directly friends, but they have a friend in common. And we took people who are three degrees separated, friends of friends of friends. And we scanned their brains while they watched comedy clips, music videos, um, politics, uh, uh, science, nature, all sorts of things. And we found that friends' brains were in sync. They weren't watching them together. They were in the scanner independently, and they'd never seen them before together. But they were processing those video clips in the same way. And people who are friends of friends were a little less similar, and people who are friends of friends of friends were even more dissimilar. And we just did a study, actually, where we got people who had just come off the bus to Dartmouth, college students, before they... Uh, met each other. And we put them in a brain scanner, and we scanned their brains. And then we waited until the social network got stable, and they had found each other. And lo and behold, we could take their brain activity when they were strangers, and we could predict who's going to become friends, who's going to become friends of friends, Spooky. and who's going to become friends of friends of friends. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Oh, Thanks. Yikes. <laughs> Does Facebook know about this? Yeah. No, but there, there was a reason. There's a study. It wasn't mine, but they used our technique. This was about a month ago that it came out, where married couples, um, it, it predicts married couples' satisfaction with their marriages, <laughs> how synchronized they are, how similar their brain activities are. So opposites attract, but if you want the long haul, it's similarity all the way down. Um. So interesting. So okay. So 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 actually, we're we're sort of magnetically pulled to pe and 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 right. kept there uh, to people like us. Yes, it makes us feel connected. It's um, it's about common ground. It's we when we're with our friends, it's effortless. We're in sync. We're literally in sync, and then we can have a conversation and go on a collective road trip all over the place, and it's fun, right? It's, it's wonderful. It's so easy. It's comfortable. 
Um, being in sync, I mean, when we're in a, uh, at, a, at a music concert, I think what's great about live music performance, and I'm so glad, I, uh, my partner and I just went to a live music performance, and it had been so long because of COVID. Yeah. But, you know, you're there with everybody just bopping together and yeah. tapping, and it's just the best, right? It yeah. just feels right. Um, so, yeah, synchrony is, uh, is great, to an yeah. extent. Yeah. Uh, David, have you ever been to a live concert? Or? <laughs> yeah. I've experienced that same phenomenon on yeah. the stage, yeah. yes. Playing together with other musicians. You l give up a little bit of yourself in order to synchronize with other people, but you gain something else. You, it, you really feel this kind of lifting. And the audience feels the same thing. They're participating in that too. This... So it's this ecstatic, wonderful, communal thing. It also ha but it also can be used for whatever ends you want to use it for. Mm. In the military, it's used, they drill people, march them back and forth, mm. and that marching helps cement them as a synchronized unit. Mm. Um, and helps people act as a team, which you want, and if you're in the military thing, you want them to do that. You want them to, everybody to right. act in, in sync. Uh, but it can be used right. to kind of direct people to do things like that. And sure. so uh, one could say that music and that kind of synchronized behavior is neutral, but you have to, yes, yeah, so be careful how it's being used. Have you, have you seen any of that dark side in your research or in, uh, yeah, what, I don't know, what other? Sure. Yeah. I think, um, well, I think what happens when you take it to the extreme, so it feels good, and we want to find the people that we're in sync with. And that, They're so great. It's That's just so great. so great. And you think about, like, music is the foundation of ritual. You, you think about the songs that we sing at uh, rituals, like Happy Birthday to You or Dayanu at Passover or what have you. It's always songs that we can all sing together in unison and feel mm. that bond, right? Um, it's all a good thing. But if you take it to the extreme, what you get are echo chambers, if you are only looking for people who think like you, who synchronize with you, then you play that out and you get these bubbles, right? And you get stagnation. You get people being derivative because they're just playing the same things. And so you've got to, I think there's a human drive to synchronize and be as one and communal and that's great. But you also need a kind of countervailing force that's going to not let it get too far. So you need the, you need the people that have the unpopular opinions, that mm. don't synchronize, that mm. have an independent voice, that um, just to, to, to pull, that, pull that out so that we don't totally get uh, in our own heads and in this bubble. You've got to keep trying to get out, to change the key, to change huh. the story. Huh. Do you know any, any weirdos like that, <laughs> uh, David? <laughs> We're, um, weirdos like who? Like people, what? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. It's just talking so abstractly. Uh, but um, no, but 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 that does seem that like it actually does seem like a thing you do well. You 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 don't kind of uh, just find the beat of everybody else's drum. You you kind of find your own, and you're like you're well known for uh, for example. I I, I read a. I think it was in Pitchfork, uh, there was a line, it was like, David Byrne would uh, collaborate with anybody for half a bag of Doritos. Um, uh, There's some truth to that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, I, lo I love collaborating. And, and, but also with people who are not necessarily the people whose brains light up in exactly the same, maybe people across, uh, uh, you know, different kinds of musicians, uh, uh, across generations, like you collaborate with high school kids, you, you do all kinds of different things like that. I love that experience of kind of getting out of my comfort zone. Uh, but I, at the same time, I realize that part of that collaboration is finding that place where you can kind of synchronize and, and find something yeah. in common. So it's a little bit, a little both. A little bit of both. Yeah. Huh. Um, I'm also, I'm also aware that, yeah. I, I, I go to concerts and I participate in them. Uh, 
sometimes when everybody's moving en masse, I find it slightly frightening. Hmm. Even, when I'm the, I, even when I'm the one singing. Really? I find it going, oh, this is a little bit too much power here. Wow. You know, and you go, can I subvert this? Or, or what, what, so whoa. what do you do? Uh, maybe make, make a joke or yeah. just kind of loosen things up a little bit. A joke that only half the people in the audience will get. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, yeah, can you, like, are there, are there uh, co collaborations like that that you, you feel like you have especially moved you or that have been momentous for you? Oh, myself? Yeah. Uh, this, well, this show, right? yeah. my co-writer, Mala, um, her writing is much more poetic than mine. Mine is more kind of, Everyday, I like everyday speech mm. and lots of ums and ahs and hey, hey, all that, <laughs> yeah. all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> hers is much more poetic, but mm. together we get some kind of balance between mm. the two that I think in the end I thought I would have never, ever come up with that by myself. Mm. Please tell me that there was a moment where you were writing a very logical everyday sentence and then she was like, stop making sense. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, okay, um, <laughs> uh, um, but okay, like what? What? Because because these issues that we're talking about, these are non-trivial problems. Like uh, the the echo chamber, the blind sp the collective blind spots. Like these are these are real problems that are making it hard for us to exist as a democracy. If you have a relative who you've ever talked about vaccines with or something? I mean, you've, you've felt this on a real level. Like, like what, what is the hack here? How, what's our way out of this? Talia. <laughs> right. Please. Thanks. No Thanks. pressure. I think it's trying to uh, get, as you said, David, get out of your comfort zone, trying to make sure you have connections with some people who don't necessarily see everything the same way you do. Um, I love it when like students are thrown together with roommates from you know different backgrounds. Um, I think we don't do enough of that. Uh, we just gravitate towards our friends because you know it's just easier. And but that's problematic. I think if we try to listen to different music on occasion, try to try to understand. You know, if you're a liberal, try to understand. Try to find a conservative that isn't, you know, you don't think is absolutely crazy and uh, try, you know, cause, because there's a point of view there that isn't necessarily nuts. So, um, and vice versa, obviously. So, uh, right, I think trying to break out of that kind of bubble that you might be in is really, really important, but it's getting increasingly challenging, especially the way we absorb our news and our information. Yeah. Well, what about you, David? Do you have any thoughts about? I mean, because I feel like you've you've kind of you've done it in your career. You keep breaking the the, the form you just made. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure I could recommend that to everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's certain aspects of society we want we want reliability and not something. Oh. oh, oh, oh our store doesn't sell that anymore mm. because I felt diff I felt I wanted to do something different. Yeah. The uh, surgeon is like, I'm trying a new site specific <laughs> yes. thing here. We don't yeah. want that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I've, one thing I've learned is that no matter how smart we think we are, we're all susceptible to, yeah. to this stuff. Um, but, but, but I do think, like, as just having seen the show and still uh, uh, starry-eyed from it, like, I do think that's one of the uh, beautiful things about the show, which is not spoiling anything. I do think it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of uh, tribute to intellectual humility. It's about how, like, at the very, at the very most basic level of the machinery we are, we are born with, um, you know, you, you know a lot less than you think you do. Mm. And, uh, and, and even that you have sort of uh, 
based your, the, the parts of you that you've based your whole sense of self on, those aren't, those aren't as concrete as you, as, as you kind of wish they were. Exactly. Uh, and the tricky part is then to let, let the audience feel, and, and everyone else, that um, this is not a bad thing. This changeability and malleability and sometimes the uh, unreliability is not entirely bad. It sounds like you're delivering bad news, but it actually allows us the possibility of change. Hmm. Because if we weren't malleable, we'd have one idea, one point of view, and stick with it to the end of our lives. And that would be kind of terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I think we get... Can I Please? Um, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I know as, as a neuroscientist that we're, our brains are constantly changing, but I think we, that comes in tension with the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and the stories other people tell us about who we are. Because stories by design are made to stick. A good story sticks, right? Uh, the best success a story could ever have is being handed down generation to generation unchanged, right? And so we get stuck, I think, in these stories about ourselves. Um, that don't respect the fact that we are actually changing and capable of change. And so I think one of the kindest things we can do for ourselves is to shake off an old story, a story that maybe fit us 10 years ago, or maybe when we were kids, but it doesn't define us now. And when I, when I go home to um, visit my parents, I love my parents, I don't know if they're watching, but <laughs> <laughs> they love me, but they have a story about me that got stuck when I was like age 12. And at age 12, I was kind of a lazy, unmotivated mess. And so every time I come home, mm -hmm. I'm that kid. You know, like that's how they see me. And they love me despite it, but that's how they see me. And it doesn't really matter what I've done with my life since then. I'm still that 12-year-old, lazy, unmotivated mess. And I internalized that for a really long time, you know, until until actually after I got tenured in Ivy League school, right? And then I thought, yeah, there's data here. You know, th I don't think this story fits me anymore, you know? I love so, imagining the scene of the tenure committee interviewing your parents and they're being like, <laughs> she's just a lazy, unmotivated mess. Thank you. Um, um, uh, there is a thing, we are almost out of time, but there was one thing that was just so great that Talia said, and, and this will, um, it, it just is the perfect ender to an evening like this uh, about, about applause. Do you want to? Sure. Well, this doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes when applause goes on a really long time, like when you're waiting for a band to come back for an encore, <laughs> the crowd will spontaneously synchronize. The, dri the drive to synchronize with our neighbors is really, really strong. And so this weird thing happens where we start off all sort of asynchronous smattering of applause, and then it's like this, right? <laughs> um, so just throwing it out there. I don't know how, how long the applause is going to go on, today, <laughs> but it might just happen. Have, have you noticed that? It shows? Especially when, yeah, what Talia says, when it's like, it has to go on to it because you're trying to bring the band back. Right. So there's an, a prolonged... And it's and like, it can, it's almost as if if we do it can, together at the same rhythm, yeah, that'll yeah. bring them out. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, um, I think we are, we are uh, n basically out of time here. Um, I just... I, first of all, I wanted to thank these two wonderful folks. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you, David, for putting on, I mean, years in the making, this gorgeous show that I hope all of you get to see. Um, not to mention, I guess you did a few other things before that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Talia, for helping us make sense of this machinery we all have in our heads that none of us understand, apparently. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. Uh, and now it's like, it's actually kind of an experiment what you're going to do when you applaud. Um, uh, but thank you all so much. Uh, and I hope you have a great night. <laughs> I forgot my phone.
Like, I don't know who I am, but that might allow me to <laughs> uh, kind of fly through the rest of my life like a kite and, inca- you know, and have better encounters and take more risks and yeah. change. Yeah, yeah. That I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm not the person who always does this. I'm, the, I'm, I'm not the person who always, you know, always has to wait for someone else to approach me. Like, I can... I could, oh, yeah, oh, sure, I could, maybe there was one time when I did, sure, maybe, yeah, let's do it, let's try it, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, kite is the feeling I keep having. It's like a revisioning of feeling untethered mm. instead of that feeling swirling. It's it's kind of liberating. Mm. That's cool. Okay, anything uh, else? Last now? thing I need to say, I think, is a uh, big hat tip for pre-production research to Susie Lechtenberg. And as well, special thanks to everybody at the Arbutus Foundation and the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, as well as Bowen Wong and Heather Radke. Bowen, Heather. Cool. Um, all right. See you next time. I mean, well, to the extent that we can see one another. You get what I mean. Catch you on the flip side. You never be the same. Radio Lab was created by Jad Abumrad and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. Susie Lechtenberg is our executive producer. Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, Richard Cusick, Akedi Foster Keys, W. Harry Fortuna, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindhu Nyanasambandam, Matt Kielty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Sarah Kari, Anna Rascuet Paz, Sarah Sandback, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster, with help from Andrew Vinales. Our fact checkers are Diane Kelly, Emily Krieger, and Natalie Middleton. Ooh.